This is Community Scene on your hometown radio station, WBRT. Join Jim Brooks, editor of the NelsonCountyGazette.com, for discussion of local, regional, and state issues. And now, with this morning's Community Scene, here's Jim Brooks. Good morning, Bardstown and Nelson County, and welcome to Local Community Scene. I'm your host uh, this uh, Friday Friday morning, Jim Brooks, and uh, um, well, the last time I was in the studio Wednesday, we had a beautiful sunny morning, and uh, not quite so sunny, but it's still beautiful outside, um, if you don't mind a little, little drizzle. Out north of town in Cox's Creek, we didn't have any drizzle, and I was hoping that's the way it would be all the way into town, but... But it, you know it is what it is, and will the weather will will um, be be different in the next hour. So just hold on, and we'll see what happens. Uh, local community scene. Uh, we bring in uh, guests uh, from around the community, movers and shakers, and uh, uh, people who are involved in community events, and um, um, just just help make our community what it is. Uh, and if you have a suggestion for a uh, a guest to be on local community scene. Uh, uh, just uh, let us know. Uh, um, uh, call the radio station, and and if you or if you see one of us out, uh, Roth or any of the rest of the crew, you might drop a drop a uh, suggestion in their ear and tell them, hey, it'd be interesting to hear what this person has to say. Uh, well, we are uh, just a, a programming note. We're also available live on BRTV. That's Bardstown Cable Channel 19. And um, I want to introduce my uh, guest today for local community scene, Ms. Rache Jennings. Rache Jennings is the uh, preservation coordinator for the city of Bardstown. And, uh, and gosh, Rache, I'm trying to think, if, how long have you been here in town now? Almost four years, Jim. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. <laughs> <coughs> well, Rache, um, Rache and I share a, a common background. We both uh, uh, graduated from Western Kentucky University, and we both have a passion for the uh, for the time we had there and uh, what a great educational experience it was and I'm not you know don't want to uh, talk poorly of any other educational experience but but uh, Western was a was a special place and I think we both uh, both agree on that absolutely <clears throat> and uh, allowed us both to pursue our passions yes and absolutely. that's and that's you know what more can education provide yeah. than to to, uh, to get you on the, on the road well uh, uh, Rache, you're you're the preservation coordinator, and that that kind of entails a lot of different hats, I guess. So, uh, but uh, in the city of Bardstown, what's that preservation coordinator job mean? Well, it, it is a lot of things, Jim. So first off, it means preservation of the 480 structures that are in our historic district. So any exterior changes, basically, what I do is if a homeowner wants to change something on their house or do a different paint color, add an addition, things that add a garage, you know, that's mm -hmm. very common things, or any outside thing, cutting trees, fences, et cetera, et cetera, anything to the outside of the property, they come see me and we go through the historic review board guidelines and we determine whether or not that that would be an appropriate change and then we go forward to the Bardstown Historic Review Board that meets once a month mm -hmm. we propose those changes and allow the board to make the decision on whether or not it meets our criteria and regulations and so that's basically the the synopsis of what we do with that portion of it um, but preservation coordinator it's it's a lot of different things as well so I do all the National Register nominations for our community countywide I assist other communities and developing what we are as a historic district and I also assist um, various projects within the state level as well promoting preservation and doing workshops and presentations across the state so a lot of different things we do basically to spread the knowledge of preservation and then Bardstown this our amazing community in Nelson County and what we do here you know to the public at large well I know that <clears throat> part of your job too is uh, uh, you have a, a, a very interesting educational component uh, as well and, and I was unable to attend uh, the last workshop, but uh, I, I've used some of those techniques myself in, uh, in uh, that uh, were discussed. Oh, yeah. Dixie Hibbs had a presentation on really how to, you know, invest the, the, investigate the history of your house if your house could talk. Oh, yeah. And in many ways, the history of your home does oh. tell a story. Absolutely. If you know, if you can look into back, into about a lot of public record, yeah. you know, so, uh, but anyway, uh, tell us a little bit about that because that's, uh, you know, I guess, you know, some of us are history geeks, you know, who really enjoy learning about, 
you know, the places we are and who built it yeah. and, um, and things. And uh, that's just kind of part and parcel with, with my wife and I. We just really enjoy the history of our homes mm -hmm. that we've lived in. Uh, but uh, what was the uh, where, what was the basis for this the, this kind of you know with Dixie? Of course, Dixie's a wealth of information about local history. Yes. But um, wh who, whose suggestion was it to do a program like this? Because it was very interesting. I'm sure. I, I did because mm -hmm. I what I do every year is part. We are a certified local government. We can get into that a little bit mm -hmm. later. But we are a CLG for the state and then uh, the, basically the nation. Meaning we follow certain guidelines for preservation and in those requirements for us to be a certified local government I have to do educational opportunities to the public mm -hmm. and this was one way to to attract people to our workshops maybe they were maybe they have their windows redone their roof is in good shape their foundation is okay but maybe they don't know the history of their home right mm -hmm. and part of the deal too is if if you love your home you're going to keep your home and maintain it which is exactly what we want to do so this was part of my little niche to try and attract people not only in this store district mm -hmm. within the community at large sure. because we if you if you live in a 1960s house you may want to know the architect you may want to know the type of design you may want to know why the formation of your street was done or mm -hmm. other things so it covered a lot of those different areas as well but mainly it it allows it to be part of that love story with your historic home as well. Mm -hmm. So what was the architect back in the day? What was the lot size? How much was my home sold for? You know, it was it sold for three mules and a bag of flour or, you know, with a small sum of cash or, you know, the different basically types that go into how the property was passed over generation to generation, how to locate that information within the deeds at the county clerk's office, mm -hmm. and then basically using that to tell your home story so that you could be a part of it as well. Well, I know it had to be interesting. You know, uh, uh, of course, uh, being a genealogy uh, buff myself, I haven't done a whole lot lately. But um, uh, and you mentioned architect. Are you familiar with John Rogers? Oh, absolutely. Um, it's interesting. My great great grandmother was uh, was uh, his sister, and on her marriage bond, it you know it's it it has the marriage bond information and list list her uh, John Rogers' sister. Oh my goodness. You know, it points out that who <laughs> who she is. <laughs> that's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. I'm gonna have to see that. That's amazing. So, but anyway, anyway, that's that's. Uh, but we're, we're, pre why is historic preservation important? I mean, we all we hear it all the time here. You know, those of us who are born and, and raised here. You know, when I was uh, when I was in grade school, we'd walk downtown to J.J. Newberry, et cetera, walk past the Talbot Tavern and St. Joe Cathedral. I thought every Kentucky Town had its own Talbot Tavern. Yes. And I thought every Kentucky Town had their, uh, you know, historic uh, basilica or the cathedral. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't until I was much older that I realized what a special place yeah. we live in. Well, not being a native um, from this community, I fell in love with Bardstown 10 years ago when I first came here over a weekend um, and toured the community and saw your structures. When I was budding in preservation, you know, through my degree, I basically came here because I had heard so much about Bardstown and how special it was. Mm -hmm. And I made a weekend venture here and saw the community and absolutely fell in love with it. I never thought I would be lucky enough to work here. I never did, and I'm so grateful that I am. Um, but I fell in love with it, as everyone else does. So Bardstown is exceptionally unique for many reasons. One is because you were the first certified local government in the state of Kentucky, meaning that the people that were in charge here, the council, the mayor, and the constituents basically came together and decided that our community here is worth preserving. Mm -hmm. And they were absolutely right, because the structures you have here, most of the time, they've been torn down in other communities. Mm -hmm. They don't exist anymore. New development comes in and sees an old building, doesn't want to pay the money to fix it, and decides, let's just tear it down and start new. But that didn't happen here. And it didn't happen for a number of reasons. Um, Dixie likes to quote that and say that we couldn't afford to take them all down, so we just <laughs> renovated them. Um, so I'm taking that from her. And uh, Possibly true, but also there was, there was a beautiful sense of nostalgia and appreciation of history in this community that, honestly, I don't get to see a lot of other areas. Mm -hmm. um, so... Coming in, they decided to pass ordinances that allowed for the buildings to be preserved within the 480 structures that we've got. And basically, over the years, it was to protect those structures and to keep the town looking as beautiful and historic as it does today. All right. And that, that of course, you're dealing with the exterior yes. structures. Uh, and and I get, the whole goal is to keep them, um, uh, well, you know, I, I don't mean to 
to point fingers, but you don't want a bright yellow building in the downtown in the historic district. That's Not right. that there's anything wrong with right. with that uh, as a pawn shop, but, yeah. but uh, there there you just want things to look. I guess what's the appropriate term? You want you want historic buildings to look period authentic yes. is that yes and so certain colors were developed over time right. and that's part of the regulations <clears throat> as well that we understand so certain colors mm -hmm. were developed over time and that bright of a yellow necessarily wasn't available in the 1800s which is when the majority uh -huh. of our structures were established here so that colors basically in the early 1800s and even to 1850 there was probably about seven colors that you had mm. you know that you could choose from as right. far as exterior colors in 1875 1890 we started to see a little bit more introduced as they were able to use uh, components to mix pigments and have that more mass produced. Mm. So over time, the colors change, just right. as with the houses. So what I think you're saying, you want it to be appropriate for that period, right? right. Um, right. So that necessarily <coughs> bright um, neon type colors were not available in the time period that most of the house were built in the historic district. Why is it important um, that, you know, what, what's the what's the benefit to a, to a home or property owner in the historic district of keeping a home uh, within certain boundaries as far as colors because some people would might look at that and say aren't you know aren't, aren't you nitpicking a little bit here mm -hmm. why can't they have an orange or a burnt orange door or, mm -hmm. or, or this trim this color is that uh, uh, where's the benefit for the homeowner there? Well, there's a lot of things. So there, <coughs> basically the property values and things with the historic district as well, it is a cohesive nature in which, and if you feel that as you're driving through. Mm -hmm. So if you're driving through certain streets and you're looking at pictures, you're going to see a repetition of colors because, like I said, at certain time periods when the houses were built, only those colors were available. And unbeknownst to a lot of us, there is a cohesiveness that creates with that aesthetic as you drive by. Mm -hmm. You get a sense of overall compatibility. You get a sense of, I don't know, basically belonging, right? Or, you know, that it's appropriate with that. You don't necessarily know it, but all of a sudden, if you see one color that's a bright, boop, you know, like a neon or mm -hmm. something that is not necessarily appropriate, you're going to be like, oh, and that, that aesthetic is broken. Mm -hmm. So it's not only about one house, it's about the whole street and the contingency of that, mm -hmm. which part of the preservation guidelines we have to follow is streetscapes, right? Mm -hmm. And so even with colors, it states within there that the colors must be applicable to the street and your neighbors. So you don't want to be the the one red flag sticking out right and and you know you're talking also time period oh, yeah. so uh, if I had a, a home built in one time period the paint colors for my house could be very different than the one two houses down Absolutely. that was built uh, 70 years later yes so this is where I'd love to talk about our regulations <clears throat> and why we do what we do right mm -hmm. so main saying trying to get everyone to understand and educate the community so Bardstown is a certified local government that means that we have to follow federal regulations of preservation. I think a lot of people are under the misunderstanding that this is just some rules Bardstown came up with. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. These are federal regulations of preservation that come down from the Secretary of the Interior, that come down from the National Park Service and the state level. So every time we update our guidelines, which we do about every 10 years, mm -hmm. because that's how long the National Park Service takes to change their mind about things, usually, sometimes not, um, we get to update those with things like new materials the National Park Service has studied over 20 or 30 years and determined that it would work with historic properties. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're learning those kind of things, and I can give you some examples um, a little bit later. But essentially, we have to follow those guidelines, and every change we propose has to be, appro has to be approved at the state and then the national level, mm -hmm. and then come back to go before our city council. So even if we want to give you some things, we necessarily can't because those are the federal regulations we're bound to follow. Okay. So that's that's part of that too. And then what, what a lot of people don't understand, and we get this all the time, is, well, so-and-so down the street has it, why can't I? Right. right? I think that's right. my number one complaint I get. Well, the, the issue is is that every house is, is a case study, and it's based on the time period that house was built, and it's, and it's basically also about the architectural style that the house was built in, and then any additions that were done to it over the last 150 years. Mm -hmm. So if they built a building or an outhouse and it's 50 years or older, we're tasked to preserve that because federal standards say it's 50 years, we're supposed to try to protect it, okay, mm -hmm. given all of the criteria are met. So 50 years or older, we're supposed to do it. So even if they add an addition and they had vinyl siding on the back before we were a CLG, right, before our rules were in right. place, right. we don't make people rip off that vinyl siding. But when they go to replace it, 
and they, inevitably it will have to be replaced because all things do have to be replaced, mm -hmm. even vinyl after so many years. If they want to replace that vinyl, we cannot allow them to do that because we can't approve that material in the historic district. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things were changed, <coughs> you know, over time. over time and before our regulations were in place, because you have to understand our regulations were in place late 60s, early 70s. Right. A lot of things were done to these homes before then that are kind of grandfathered in until people want to make changes. Right. When we want to make changes, we update it accordingly and appropriately. And then as well, take it for instance, an 1800 structure. If you want to change something on that structure, you've got one material, basically, wood. I mean, you know, mass-produced metal or different things of that nature didn't exist at that point. Now, if we go to a 1930s or a 1940s bungalow, a craftsman, mm -hmm. for instance, well, you've got all different kinds of material. You know what I'm saying? You've mm -hmm. got, you know, composites. You've got different things that you can kind of utilize um, and all kinds of different colors as well. So mm -hmm. the 1800 structure probably had uh, two to three colors. You know, the 1930s has 150 to choose from. Mm -hmm. So it's all based on that and kind of those criteria. So each house is looked at individually with its own components and determined what's applicable with that. Okay. So uh, now the uh, what's the process, say, um, you know, I have a property in the historic uh, district, and I want to do some landscaping or some some exterior uh, changes. What's the what's the process for that? Absolutely. So you would um, our guidelines are available <clears throat> at the City of Bardstown website under Government Historic Preservation, and you'll see Design Review Guidelines. That's mm -hmm. all 140 pages of everything we are in charge that we are tasked to follow, right, from mm -hmm. the federal government. So basically, if you want to change something, you take a look at those guidelines. They're broken up by part landscaping, windows, siding, roofing, additions, new construction, et cetera, et cetera. And you take a look at it and you see whether or not what you want to do is applicable. And then you come see me. We'll fill out an application. It's a nominal fee, usually to get in front of the board, um, usually around $60. Most of the time it's less than that, depending mm -hmm. on what you want to do. And you come basically fill that out. You discuss the plan with me and what you want to do. I will go through the guidelines with you, explain whether or not that's okay, and then we go before the board and we let them determine whether they feel it's appropriate. They vote the third Tuesday of the month, and then per Article 15, our ordinance, which states that we can exist, then the city council on the fourth Tuesday mm -hmm. um, will vote on that and give final approval. And once they do, I send out your certificate and your approval letter, and you can begin work on your home stating the conditions set forth. And then the first of the month is usually my deadline. So it takes about 30 days because you have to go through so many separate entities to get approval. Right. But it, it's about a month-long process. So come to me early and get it approved, and then hopefully we can go from there. Well, I also know that you're a, a tremendous resource for people who have a home and they're thinking about doing something different. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you... Uh, you know, you, you offer your, your, it's, your advice is free. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. <clears throat> absolutely. Right. And I, I love that because I don't want you to come with me to a project and have it all designed out and then be upset when I say, well, this element won't work or this particular style won't work. If you come to me in the early stages, I can say, well, you know what? This is what they're going to want. These are what the guidelines state, and that's mm -hmm. why they want it this way. You know, and if you want certain elements, and they always want to match or mimic the historic structure that's on the building with whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. So I have at least enough time and expertise in that to be able to guide you along through that before you get your hopes up on something and then maybe it not go through because my goal once you get to me unless I'm you know I've, I've informed you that I don't think it'll work once you get to me my goal is to get you through the HRB board you know it no surprises no right. usually no catches sometimes they they do surprise me but my goal is to help you and that's what I want to do mm -hmm. so come see me and talk to me and I will help you in any way I can all right, well, Roche, we need to take a commercial break. We'll be back with uh, more local community scene after these messages. Stay tuned. It's time for more of Community Scene on your hometown station, WBRT. Here's Jim Brooks. All right, you're back with local community scene. Jim Brooks here. Be, we will be with you till the top of the hour, and then stay tuned for the best in local news here on WBRT. Uh, my guest today is Rache Jennings. Rache is the uh, is the preservation coordinator for the city of Bardstown, and and uh, that's a uh, 
uh, a job that keeps her busy, I know, and, um, uh, you know, we're, we, are, we are a happening place. There's lots of stuff going on. And I think all you need to do is look at a city council agenda, uh, the second one of the month, and you will see uh, that there's a lot of, lot of stuff happening, a lot of people improving their properties in the historic district as, as those projects uh, have to come before the historic review board. Yes. And, and for, for approval. And, um, you know, I have uh, had business owners, and my, a brother-in-law of mine in particular, who uh, complained uh, bitterly that he felt that that process was just micromanaging mm -hmm. of local businesses. Of course, he was wanting to do his issue with signage, you know. Mm -hmm. But, but, um, but, but the, the purpose of the historic district is not to keep you from doing things. You know, it's, uh, it's to have things done in a cohesive manner. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, if you, um, uh, and, and, they, and, the, and the historic district has its own sign regulations. It does, yes. You know, that are separate from the city of Bardstowns. Yes. And, and, you know, and, but even the city of Bardstowns are, you know, are, uh, I won't say they're restrictive, but they're reasonable. Mm -hmm. And when you look, when you drive north of the railroad tracks, it doesn't look like Dixie Highway. No. You know, we don't, we, ha we have fast food places, but the signs aren't huge mm -hmm. standing overhead on the, you know, big tall poles. So, mm -hmm. but anyway, uh, everything is for a reason, uh, Roche, and I know that, uh, um, uh, tell us a little bit more, uh, you know, we, the exterior of the home is what, yeah. what's under your purview. Yes, I do not handle the interior <clears throat> of the structures. The only way interior of your homes are monitored is if you apply for a historic tax credit. Mm -hmm. um, and that's through the state that it actually doesn't apply through me. Um, but they will monitor the inside as well as the mm -hmm. exterior to get that federal money. Now, what's, uh, what are the guidelines for, for that? Uh, are you you're familiar with? Yes. The, like for interior work, what, the, what, 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 were the, uh, what are they looking for? Well, they want it to remain as original as possible, which also usually upsets homeowners because usually they want to take out a wall, make the space more open. Right. But usually for historic tax credits, there are things such as you keep all interior walls that are original mm -hmm. so we can't have that open floor pen as much as people would like a lot of the interior trim and designs the original staircase etc cetera, etc cetera, those kind of things are required and usually are difficult for homeowners you know that don't that want to remodel the inside and are kind of put under that restrictive purview right mm. one thing too they usually do not and they they have not yet at least to my knowledge allowed an attached garage and that was something I was really surprised by, and I didn't necessarily understand that at the beginning of coming here. Um, but they, they said, of course, all garages were detached in the beginning, and they were right. You know, the sandboard maps, at least in the 1920s and 30s, um, do show that the auto houses, as they're labeled, were all separate buildings, and they were usually modified carriage houses, mm -hmm. you know, not attached to the structures. Right. So if you want to do an attached garage, unfortunately, they won't allow you to get that federal money to help with that. Usually there's a minimum requirement around $20,000 um, to remodel. If you do that, then you apply. They will divvy out a certain percentage of that to come back on your taxes. Mm -hmm. And that's how that works. But that entire process is through the state. Right. I can always help people get to the state website and tell them who to contact, but that entire review process doesn't necessarily work with me. Mm -hmm. As far as my job here, and if you're not applying for historic tax credits, it's just the exterior. And the inside, you're allowed to do whatever you want. Now, uh, sometimes, uh, and I, I've seen this in the minutes and uh, meetings I've attended, you're looking at the exterior from a public uh, right-of-way. Yes. And that, and for most people, they, you know, we consider the street, you know, street yeah. in front of the house. Uh, but uh, it's not always just the street. No. Is considered a public right of way. Exactly, Jim. So essentially what it is is a public way, which again, let's go, I want to start with this too. That's a federal regulation. That isn't mm -hmm. something we we uh, have done that we decided. A public way and the visibility from the public way is street or alley, okay? Alley. Alley. Yeah. That means an alley behind your home as well, okay? Mm. So what it is is if it's not visible from a public way, you're allowed to do a lot more things. You're allowed to do different materials. You're allowed to use different things. If it is visible from a public way, a street or an alley, including the rear of your home, unfortunately, mm -hmm. you have to adhere to the guidelines 
for the appropriate time period and architectural style of your home, which usually means wood, right? right. Um, so that's kind of the difference. Um, for instance, you know, if you have a porch at the rear of your home and you have certain elements there, you're not allowed to do, like for instance, if you have a metal railing or something with, um, you know, certain things, you can't necessarily do that at the front of your house because that's visible from the street, right? So at the rear, it's not visible and you're allowed to do that. At the front, you <coughs> wouldn't be allowed to do that. Right, right. Um, and I know that the historic district, and, and I've had uh, people point this out to me in, in all over the place. Um, of course, the historic district goes back to the late 60s, early 70s, uh, but people have been making changes to uh, historic homes in the district, you know, probably from the time they were soon after they were built. Um, and of course, a lot of the changes weren't documented. Yes. Uh, and so. Uh, and there are, and you can go all around and you will find materials um, in plain view that probably would not today meet muster. Exactly. Uh, would not be approved by the Historic Review Board. Absolutely. So you've got someone with a, an early 1900s <clears throat> house, for instance, that added an addition on the back and you and they've got, let's say it's wood, mm -hmm. but on the addition they used a historic aluminum siding. Mm -hmm. Per what we're supposed to do for our federal standards, if it's 50 years or older, we're supposed to allow that to be retained because now that his, that addition mm -hmm. has met historic criteria as far as time. So 50 years or older, no matter kind of what they did, unless it's right. vinyl, we the federal government just will not allow us to have vinyl no matter what. They're, they're like, get rid of that. Angelic use windows, they just want them completely gone. Those are the two things. They're like, I don't care when they were added, get rid of them. Um, <laughs> but if that aluminum siding was added, then we are tasked now to preserve that. Mm -hmm. For instance, there are homes that have aluminum siding on them that would have originally had wood siding, but it was done mm -hmm. over 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. So now that aluminum siding, we're tasked to preserve that. It shows the house progression over time. It shows the evolution of materials over time. Mm -hmm. So, believe it or not, even the additions that weren't exactly subpar for historic guidelines now tell a story that we're entitled to preserve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting, <clears throat> which also allows for a lot of the confusion, such as right. why why can't we have this and my neighbor have that, right? Right. right. Well, you know, it's, it, and it's understandable that you see, well, they use this material and, and, and why can't I? Exactly. Why? And then, you know, you, you it, it leads people thinking, well, why aren't the rules being applied to everybody right. uniformly? And in fact, uh, each house is evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. You've got it. And you really can't go back and say, you need to tear the siding off off yes. of this because it's visible from an alley when it was put on 50 years ago yeah. over yeah. 50 years ago yeah. exactly if that's the case and i guarantee you i promise because we've had a lot of open records requests um we've had a lot of people question and i go through each thing with them you mm -hmm. know if you've got questions come talk to me we'll, we'll try to go through it and try to get you some answers there are, there are several possibilities of why they've got it and i can't one the addition was done over 50 years old that means we're tasked to preserve it whatever it is like i said minus vinyl siding we can't keep it um, number two, the additions or changes were done before our regulations were in place. Mm -hmm. In the early 60s and 70s, people were adding and doing things to these homes. They had no regulations before that, right? Mm -hmm. So they were making all kinds of changes with whatever material they wanted. Mm -hmm. That is grandfathered in until there is a change necessarily if it's an inappropriate material and we go back with what would be appropriate with that, okay? Mm -hmm. All of that ev evaluated per case-by-case -case basis, the time period your house was built and the architectural style. And then number three, um, it was done and then, like I said, basically before those two time periods or now it meets the criteria of being preserved. Mm -hmm. Certain materials are now that weren't historic. This National Park Service now says, you know what, we need to preserve that. It's another element in the time period we need to document. Well, and I think, uh, you know, and then sometimes things get done and there's no application. And, oh, yeah. I mean, things are just kind of done on just not, you know, scoff laws out there violating the law. And, you know, we don't have renegade architects out there and construction guys, but, but things just got done. And, you know, well, I want an addition. Well, all right, yeah. let's do it. Absolutely. And, and, I mean, that even happens today. People will do projects, building projects or, and things. And and where there were supposed to be certain permits mm -hmm. done and sometimes they normally they happen but sometimes you have instances where they where they don't simply you know sometimes you don't people don't aren't aware of, of the requirements yes and I, I think education is a huge part of what yes. you must you do yes uh, to let people know 
know, know about the process and and your role in helping them through that. Yes, absolutely. And that's that's the whole point is once you understand <clears throat> that these rules, the 50 years or older, a lot of things were done before, you know, our rules were in place. It's by case by case basis, mm -hmm. you know, time period architectural style. For instance, you know, Shadow Lawn didn't have a front porch originally. Mm -hmm. It that beautiful Greek Revival porch was put on circa 1910, you know, and mm -hmm. that's in the historic walking tour by the way. So that that porch addition is now an element even though it wouldn't have been original and isn't necessarily subpar with a federal style house that the, right. what that is it is now tasked to be preserved because it was done in 1910 and so that that's what we're kind of talking about here mm -hmm. um, and absolutely there are a lot of people that come to me that are usually quite angry and my job is to sit there and explain to them and make sure that they understand these are the rules they're federal regulations this is why we do it and kind of go through this whole process mm -hmm. and usually we we end that meeting very amicable you know we we shake hands and everything's all right because now instead of just feeling like certain people getting certain things they understand the rules are just what they are but there's a lot of nuances with that that allow sure. things yeah sure and that you are a resource to help people to help guide homeowners and property owners yes. through uh, uh, through the process. Absolutely, come see me because I believe it or not, I love all of these homes, and <clears throat> I'm very grateful to work with all of the members of the community and help in any way I can. And I learn too as we go along. So I may have not studied each individual house. I've definitely looked at each individual house and been by there several times, but I may not know the exact history of the architectural. I may not know exactly when an addition was built, but I learned that along the way. So I learn, and then the homeowner gets to hopefully get what they need along the way. Right, right. Well, uh, you know, the, I think, um, um, and, and I hope that, I've always thought there needs to be an education, go on my soapbox a little bit, yeah. that proper, people that buy property in the historic district, they're, they're almost should be required some sort of educational component yeah. so that they know what they're getting into. Because owning property in the historic district, I, I think it's, it's not just like, you know, buying a house in a subdivision. Yeah. Because, you know, you're, it, it's more than a home or a business because you are basically become the caretaker of that building's history yes you know you're you're not the first owner occupant or the business owner you are one of many and many more will come if if everything goes well yes and so you are the caretaker yes well and that's what i usually if if people are, are whenever they buy in the historic district i usually love for them to set up a meeting with me initially mm -hmm. that is my favorite thing to do please come see me let's go through it from the beginning and usually i have a little synopsis of information about their house the mm -hmm. style time period it was built etc i pull out the old sandborn maps i show them the original plan of what it looked like and how it's changed over time with different additions and mm -hmm. things of that nature and so usually we we used i love to do that as an experience and then i explain the rules and explain explain why we do that and explain certain elements on their home that would have to stay right mm -hmm. because they would be architecturally important enough they're older than 50 years and it needs to be this way so that so. those are all of those components I try to do <clears throat> in one single meeting all right uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the projects that was recently uh, that the council recently approved was the uh, uh, that that has kind of been in and out of the works for a while I know that uh, the Newcom Oil Company has, for a long time, wanted to replace their five star at Second and and Stephen Foster, um, and and I know that there had been a couple of different applications over the last few years of of them wanting to uh, to do that, and and but more recently, um, there was a plan developed in a in a uh, to uh, to to allow them to do that in a uh, in a. Uh, I don't want to say palatable way, but mm -hmm. a way that would uh, uh, that would kind of help preserve the streetscape, I guess yes. you will, uh, because uh, they also own the home next to yes. the old Dobbs house as we know it, uh, and that um, they they wanted to remove the house, and and they will with this new plan, they will move it, not remove it, mm -hmm. not demolish it. Yes. It'll be it'll be, it will be preserved. Uh, but anyway, tell us a little bit of, about that. I have had people uh, tell me that they thought well. That, that things weren't done, that things that, that well, they, the, of course, we all know the Newcombs family, that, that the new, they got it because the Newcombs, you know, mm -hmm. or whatever, because of their money or whatever, but there was really a process in place. Absolutely. And a lot of input oh, yeah. on both sides. From and that's really probably why this happened. It did. Enabled it. 
Well, this is well, essentially, I don't know if a lot of the people know this. We have been in court for several years now, mm -hmm. them fighting to demolish the house. Mm -hmm. So we have had periodic meetings and been going forward because they want to expand their gas station. Sure. So and they have the right to want to do that. Yeah, they sure. do, absolutely. And, but of course, my job is to preserve that house, right? right. Now, ideally, it would be to keep it right there. Yep. That's what our ultimate goal always is to do. But we were fighting in court, of course, um, trying to go by, I, we want to preserve the house, they want to demolish, et cetera. So this has come to basically an agreement and it, it came, we, we took this basic proposal to the state of Kentucky, the mm -hmm. Kentucky Heritage Council, um, and talked to the CLG coordinator there, who's my boss at the state level. Mm -hmm. And um, she was, you know, of course, th the task is, well, save the house, save the house, right? That's what our job is to do. But whenever we talked about this, well, what what is necessarily going to go back? If they if something were to happen with this house, what's going to be built back? And mm -hmm. what is that going to do? And how is that going to affect the streetscape? Because we don't want that. What they proposed after talking with me and Dixie Hibbs at some length um, was essentially an 1800s federal style building, mm -hmm. which would have mimicked the original structure before the Dobbs house. Hmm. And so that gas station will mimic this, and it won't be exactly like an 1800s, because sure. we're not allowed to do that either by federal guidelines. Okay. It can't be an exact replica of an 1800s building. The federal government doesn't want that to be in place. Okay. They want it to mimic, they want it to feel like an old structure, but it can't have the exact same elements as an 1800s. Right. So certain right. elements would change, and you'll, you'll see that in the design. Um, but... It, our goal is to make it feel, and when they proposed the two-story element right up against the streetscape mm -hmm. that mimicked that original structure even before the Dobbs house, mm -hmm. I'll be honest, I sent it to the state because I, I had never seen a plan like that before in my life. I'd never seen that much attention to detail mm -hmm. in building a gas station. And, and also, the agreement was we will not tear down the house, right. we will relocate it, and we will save it, right? right. That's an ultimate goal. So now I'm proposed with, we are not going to tear down the house, we are going to relocate the house, and we are going to build back a structure that would bring it back to the streetscape as what the original plan was, and the building that was before the Dobbs. And I brought in, I'm going to be honest, I had a, a team with me, Dixie mm -hmm. Hibbs and Mr. David Hall. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> so I had David and Dixie overlooking this project with me and making sure, and we're still doing that. We're all still meeting and making sure that this meets the criteria that we need it to do. And then I essentially sent it to the state and we sent those plans to the state. And the state came back and also said, we've never seen anything like this, but we really feel that this is the best possible scenario. Because we don't know the outcome in the courts. We, right. we don't know what's going to happen with the house. And you're saving the house. And we mm -hmm. get back a beautiful structure that mimics what was originally there. Mm -hmm. And so the state didn't approve that by any means. Right. But they came back with a very favorable response stating that they felt that would really fit nicely within the street, street shape design of Bardstown. Mm -hmm. And so that was the response we got back. And, of course, the board proceeded and followed that recommendation from the state. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, it, um, you know, one of the things I remember in one of your earlier presentations uh, that, that, go, that dealt with the demolishing the house was what that would do to the streetscape. Yes. And that was, it, it would be, a, it, would have, it would have represented a, a huge hole. Yes. Uh, and it would have, you know, even though that, you know, and, you know, and you have to kind of, uh, you know, for a lot of people, I mean, my wife and I had a lot of these discussions about balancing the community needs versus those of the private property owner. Yes. And where, you know, how, how all the regulations fit mm -hmm. and everything. Because, uh, of course, the property owner has the right to want to make money and get yeah. a return on their investment. And I know they had argued, argued that point. Uh, but also, uh, the, you know, your, your job as preservation coordinator, it's a historic property. Um, so it sounds like both both goals were met with the, this proposal that came out. It was, and it it's been an agreement that honestly I'm 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 very happy with. At least we have, we've saved the house. Mm -hmm. um, we've we've at least come to that point that we were able to do that. We have preserved the integrity of the streetscape, and the state appears appears to be very happy with the overall mm -hmm. outcome as well. So it's going to be very interesting. It's going to be something that we've never seen here. But I think the community is going to be very proud of. Well, it, it, uh, I don't know. To me, I thought it was a very creative, innovative way. Yes, yes, for, it was. Uh, to, to kind of 
meet both goals? Well, we tried really hard on a lot of ends. And I'll never forget when David was there with me and, you know, I brought this out and he, he stood there and looked at it and I was literally a little pensive, you know, at my desk. I was like, this is David Hall, right? Yeah. He's my, he's also my mentor and someone I admire very, very much and, you know, care about. So I was like sitting there like palm sweaty and he goes, all right. So, and we went forward. Now we've changed, we're going to change details about it. Mm -hmm. There are things that have to be modified with it to make sure that it meets the criteria that we need it to meet. Sure. But the overall design um, was something that, you know, we were proud of at least um, to be able to go forward. In other words, we didn't want another small gas station that looked modern to go there. Right. That's not what Bardstown is. Right. If this is going to happen, then it needs to match. And I feel like this, this design, proposed design has done something to not only mimic and, and meet that but also to enhance our streetscape as well mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. we need to take another commercial yes. break Rache. uh you're listening to local community scene with jim brooks and my guest today Rache jennings uh, we'll be back after these messages stay tuned all right you're back with local community scene and uh Jim Brooks here with you till the top of the hour. We have about uh, seven minutes left. My guest this morning has been Rache Jennings. Rache is the uh, preservation coordinator for the city of Bardstown. And uh, gosh, Rache, it seems like it was just yesterday I wrote, the, I researched that uh, article welcoming you to the uh, <laughs> Uh, to the community, and I'm like, who is this Rache Jennings? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I found a wealth of information about you, and I was really excited yeah. uh, when, I, when I saw your background, and I thought, well, the city has done very well in, in, uh, in, in tracking her down. Oh, thank you, Jim. I appreciate your support and kindness along the way, too. You've been amazing to us in the Historic District and the HRB Board. We always appreciate you as well. Well, the... Um, uh, if anybody has questions about the, the processes, uh, um, how can they, how do they contact you? Absolutely. Rache? So either you can call City Hall at 502-348-5947 and ask to speak to Rache Jennings, the preservation coordinator. And then come talk to me. We'll set up an appointment or I can do some house visits um, depending on the, the craziness of my week and what I can mm -hmm. get scheduled. But usually you, you come to the office, talk about what you want to do. We'll go over the guidelines. We'll discuss it and I'll help you through that process every step of the way. All right. Uh, now, we, we, early in the show, we talked about the uh, the workshop you had with uh, Dixie Hibbs. Yes. And I know there's another one coming up. Uh, uh, actually, bringing someone back to town who who did a workshop was it two years ago? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Miss uh, Jason, Jason uh, Church. Church. Yes, absolutely. So he is the um, he is the materials conservator for the National Center of uh, Preservation and Technology Training within Louisiana, and Jason is the foremost um, expert on cemetery repair and restoration. When the National Park Service do a preservation brief or did a preservation brief on cemetery repair, which that's basically like a how to and mm -hmm. approved federal how to you know a little booklet it was just Jason that was quoted with his materials and his you know guidelines and his things so he's absolutely he's nationwide renowned he's known throughout but he also does things overseas um, he teaches other communities as well and he is coming June 14th and 15th mm -hmm. here to Bardstown we do have some slots available limited availability but we have some available and he's going to do a two-day workshop it will be a Friday June 14th and then the 15th um, will be Saturday and it will be all day both days we'll mm -hmm. provide breakfast and lunch and it's free to anyone who would like to learn how to preserve cemeteries headstones or works within that all right and i'm assuming that there will be uh like some classroom or yes. will it be all field it will be partially classroom and partially field, field so okay. the first half of the day on friday until lunchtime will be in the Kobeck building upstairs where all of my workshops normally mm -hmm. occur and it will be it will be classroom and basic study mm -hmm. the rest of that time will be out in the field actually doing work within the city cemetery so we are so excited to have him back here and to do this well uh, those of us who have an interest in genealogy oh, yes. and you know if you've, you've uh, i, I my, my kids used to make fun of me for tra traipsing around in cemeteries looking for family members, you know. But no. uh, um, but the uh, uh, there's a, the right way and the wrong way to uh, to uh, clean uh, headstones. And uh, uh, Jason Church will show you a way that will the the right way to do it that will clean them. And he is just a wealth of information. Absolutely. Uh, because what you don't want to do is to 
treat or put anything on these headstones, which are made of varying materials throughout the ages, whether it was uh, concrete or marble or limestone. You don't want to do anything to these stones that's going to shorten their lifespan. Exactly. And sometimes chemicals you put on there can damage them. And most times the chemicals people use do are horribly <clears throat> detrimental to those stones. Mm -hmm. So number one, for anyone who's listening, absolutely do not ever use a bleach or any chemical compound to clean a headstone. Mm -hmm. The only approved solution from the National Park Service is a solution called D2, which is available online, and you can Google that and find that, and he'll talk about that as well. But never, ever use bleach. Don't use any kind of chemicals on it, because what that does is it absorbs into your headstone, mm -hmm. and then as the temperature fluctuates, it breaks it apart from the mm -hmm. inside and will eventually crackle that headstone. Right, right. I, I attended the workshop last or yes. two years ago, and um, and and saw the work that the, you know the participants did cleaning, uh, cleaning headstones at the city cemetery, and it was phenomenal the change. And I still, when I drive through, I still see those headstones, mm -hmm. and it's like, you know, they're going to look good for a very long time now. Absolutely. You know, cleaning the moss and and, and things off of yeah. them. But it's uh, it. You know, and, and it takes elbow grease. I mean, it's the D2 and the brush and elbow yeah, grease. Yeah, absolutely. It's a horse hair brush. <laughs> it's a very specific thing. You know, we don't want to use any metal or wire mm -hmm. that could hurt the stone or take off the coating that protects it. So very specific materials, a lot of elbow grease, but it's years of last long, beautiful work that you're going to see from that. Right. So right. And the whole purpose is preservation. Absolutely. You know, yeah. so that the genealogist in the future can... Uh, can traipse around and find their ancestors again with okay. and be able to read the uh, information on that. That's right. So if anyone wants to attend that, contact me at City Hall at 502-348-5947. Again, we'd love to have you. We do still have some open slots, so we want to fill those. And the Nelson County Gazette, there will be a banner ad uh, linked to the uh, flyer. Uh, they'll be showing up soon, so uh, uh, that'll be another reminder to uh, uh, about this uh, about this workshop and it's free it's uh, the price is right absolutely <laughs> and food provided breakfast and lunch provided so all right uh, well Rache, we're down to about the last minute and a half of the uh, of the show thanks for taking time out of your busy day to come on not a problem thanks for having me Jim. always enjoy uh, uh, enjoy talking uh, talking history and historic preservation um, well let's see um, um, going to st preview the next show but i'm not sure who the who the guest will be uh, or if we'll have one next friday anyway uh, stay tuned for the news at the at the top of the hour i will put a plug in for bradford and brooks which is every wednesday here on wbrt uh, uh, we talk uh, with this uh, margie bradford and i talk uh, talk are talking now with constitutional candidates for office across kentucky and that's uh, we had rotke atkins who's a democratic cabinet candidate for governor last uh, Wednesday, and uh, he was uh, a wealth of information. So anyway, uh, d don't miss us on Wednesday. Uh, again, Rache, thanks, and thanks for all you do for our community. I know that uh, sometimes your office, you're kind of on the hot seat sometimes, <laughs> uh, in, in, but it's, you, do, you do a very important job. And uh, and and I, my hat is off to you for the job you do. I appreciate it, Jim. I can honestly say I truthfully love what I do. I love helping people in the community, and I love giving everyone as much as they possibly can get, and trying to help them throughout the whole process. So come see me for sure. All right, and that uh, city hall number is three four eight five nine four seven. All right, and uh, you can and if you ask for Rache, they will actually put her put you through to her. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you can talk to me, and I'm not scary. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks everyone and have a great day and stay tuned for the news. Barge at the top and W246 AT Bardstown, 1320 AM and 97.1 FM, your number one radio station.